All right, thank you. Uh, I will now call the meeting, the March 3rd, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission to order. And we'll begin with uh, roll call attendance. Commissioner Bertrand. Present. Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner alternate. Uh, sorry about this. Commissioner uh, Caput. I'll come back to that one. Here. Can you hear me? Yes. Commission alternate Schiffrin. Here. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Uh, Commissioner Ari Parker. Here. Commissioner Rotkin. <laughs> Commissioner Eads. Present. Commission alternate Quinn. Present. Okay, and I know we're waiting for one more, so we'll keep an eye out for Commissioner Hurst. I think I was uh, passed over to, this is Kristen Peterson. I'm, I'm sorry, Commissioner Peterson, I apologize. No problem. You have a quorum, Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Yesenia. We'll now move on to oral communications. This is a time for members of the public to address the commission on items within the jurisdiction of the commission <clears throat> that have not that are not addressed on the agenda. And the commission will listen to all communications in compliance with state law, we may not take action on items that are not on the agenda. Uh, for speakers, please uh, state your name clearly so that you, that can be recorded in the minutes of our meeting. And I am looking to see if we have hands raised. I see a couple of attendees. <clears throat> Commissioner McPherson, did you wanna start, make your comment? Um, yeah, thank you. First of all, yes. I wanna welcome uh, Commissioner Ari Parker to the RTC, welcome, nice to have you here. Um, also, I wanted to make everyone aware that the county has posted an analysis of the Greenway Ballot Initiative on our website. Uh, the board ordered the analysis last month, which discusses the impacts uh, as such as fiscal and policy and other impacts on county operations. I really encourage everyone to review the analysis, which uh, really contains uh, very valuable information, no matter what side of the fence you might be on regarding the trail or the trail only or the trail next to their existing rails or whatever. Um, and I want to thank members of the public who continue to engage uh, with the commission on this topic. We know that we're getting a lot of comments, each and every one of us. And um, recently I've heard uh, increased feedback from my district regarding uh, transportation project funding in particular. There seems to be a wide spectrum of misunderstanding on this complex topic. And although we have discussed it many times uh, in the context of considering specific projects, there seems to be um, uh, some confusion regarding on how the projects get funded, dedicated streams of funding, competitive grant funding, and on and on. Um, I think it'd be helpful if we put a, a topic on a transportation funding on a future agenda and ask uh, the staff to provide us with uh, a comprehensive overview of how the RTC uh, identifies these funding sources uh, and the complicated processes that they have to use to succeed in receiving that funding. Um, I don't need to leave this meeting at 10, and that's why I'm making this comment now uh, for a California State Association of Counties or CSAC meeting but my alternate Jenny Johnson will be here to step in. And I thank you chair for allowing you to make these comments. I really encourage everybody to take a look at this report that was just posted yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. I appreciate the, and I think the public appreciates the heads up on this. And uh, I too encourage folks to take a look at that. Uh, Commissioner Rotkin. Just want to report that I'm here for the record. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we'll <clears throat> let the minutes reflect that Commissioner Rutkin has arrived. And I heard all of uh, Director uh, McPherson's comments as well. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, we will now, uh, I'll now call on members of the public who are here for oral communications. And we'll start with Ben Vernazza, Vernazza, excuse me. Good morning, uh, commissioners and public. Uh, I've reported to you in the past about the UFLY program um, at the airport and at high schools in Santa Cruz County. 
Uh, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Let me give you the good news. Salinas has had this program for over six years or almost six years. And they have, they have uh, converted juvenile delinquents into juvenile citizens, or I must, I must say young citizens and are still doing it. And they're sharing it with our county. Um, and by the end of, or uh, the end of this year, we'll have over 400 high schools with the AOPA uh, program for the high schools, you can fly. Some recent developments, United Airlines announced several weeks ago that they have a uh, new airport that they're going to do in West Phoenix for 500 students tuition paid to be pilots, be trained as pilots. And Delta announced just last week to make it unanimous that the major airlines will no longer require a college degree to, to get a job as a pilot. Uh, I have uh, Joe Randuki, who is my co-chair. He's a super, past superintendent of Sunnyvale and Kalinga. And uh, he's been working with the county. And I will tell you that that's the bad news. We wanted uh, the Paro Valley High School to start first. They're dragging their feet. Um, and we, and we need to go ahead with this. I ask for your help by, through the press, through your pressure on the school districts to do that, including Spanish speaking public journal so that it gets to the public. Oh. That's a new signal, <laughs> notification <laughs> signal. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Vernaza. And if you uh, want to communicate uh, further information, please do email uh, the commissioners about this issue and uh, things we can do to um, support. Okay, um, uh, let's see. Next up, uh, our next speaker is Barry Scott. We can hear you. Oh. You're on mute, Mr. Scott. So sorry. There you go. Good morning, good morning commissioners. Uh, my name is Barry Scott, and I'm here representing Coast Connect, Friends of the Rail and Trail, and Coastal Rail Santa Cruz. Um, at the recent uh, February 17th Transportation Policy Workshop, staff presented a proposal to change the description of Highway 1 widening Ox Lane's bus on shoulder project between State Park and Freedom as part of the environmental review process currently underway. We have asked Caltrans and RTC under the Public Records Act to provide us with copies of the proposed project document that was stated to have been jointly submitted by Caltrans District 5 and the RTC to Caltrans headquarters. This project, as described by staff, proposes to not replace the two railroad bridges that span Highway 1 in favor of a so-called interim trail alternative or phase that would replace significant portions of the existing rail line with a trail only. The RTC apparently intends to request state funding for this alternative. Replacement of the railroad bridges is included in the project description in every single place in the original and governing Highway 1, HOV, CEQA, and NEPA document for this project, as well as in every other related programming, environmental, and policy document. The bridges are in good shape and do not need replacement other than as caused by the highway widening. Furthermore, converting the bridges to trail only would use would require Surface Transportation Board consideration of abandonment of the Coast and Felton rail lines and approval of an RTC-driven request to rail bank both lines. We believe that this approval is extremely unlikely. We also believe that the California Transportation Commission is unlikely to approve any project that is so clearly inconsistent with decades of Santa Cruz County transportation policy plans, environmental documents, and public sentiment. We ask that the RTC commit all possible resources to restoring, repairing, and making the line useful. Complaints that there's no freight may stem from the fact that repairs need to be made. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Our next speaker is Jack Nelson.
Yes, yes, good morning, commissioners. I'm Jack Nelson. I'm a retired professional land use planner and environmental planner. And thanks for um, having the public uh, speaking uh, this morning. I appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to say just a word about carbon dioxide. Um, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere has increased by 50% uh, due to human causes over the pre-industrial era. Um, now, if you went to the doctor and the doctor said your blood pressure is up by 50%, you need to do some lifestyle modifications, you might think your doctor is onto something. The problem with CO2 is that it doesn't conform to any laws of human empathy. It just does what it does. The only laws CO2 adheres to are the laws of physics. So with this increase in carbon dioxide, we are developing for ourselves a brutal dictator of the atmosphere, uh, both gradually warming the atmosphere, but also with the potential to cause abrupt climate change. Uh, if you're in with the details on climate science, uh, you're aware that uh, scientists have found that climate change sometimes occurs abruptly. It doesn't give you a lot of warning. Uh, right now, CO2 is marshaling its forces on our stable civilization's borders and is threatening to invade us with a kind of climate change that will forever change our lives and call into question our civilization. I hope that you commissioners begin to show more concern about this issue in the decisions you make, uh, which are in behalf of the public. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Next up, we have Ryan Sarnataro. Yes, hello. Um, this is Ryan Sarnataro from Live Oak. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the feasibility of freight, and I'm going to talk from a personal perspective because uh, back in the last century, I was the president of a warehouse distribution company in San Francisco, and we, we actually delivered here in Santa Cruz. We delivered the Staff of Life food bin. We had full pallets going to Beckman's Bakery. We had a 100,000-square-foot building with a rail siding, and we were bringing in some pretty significant freight from the Midwest, uh, we were bringing in grains and beans. We were bringing in uh, soy milk from the factory in, in Michigan. We were bringing in full truckloads of toilet paper, bottled water from Sacramento. And that rail siding sat there, and, and I grew up in a place where I actually unloaded rail cars when I was a teenager. And, uh, you know, I thought it'd be great to use this. Could never make it work. The reason why I couldn't make it work in San Francisco, in the industrial district, Hunter's Point, was that there was insufficient volume. And in order to use a freight uh, siding, you're kind of part of a network. And you have to have sufficient volume. And if you look around Santa Cruz, there's no rail sidings at any of the retail places. It's not like you're going to deliver rail to Costco, the biggest retailer in town. Uh, you don't have anybody producing anything that would go out on a truckload basis, let alone a rail car basis. So this whole idea that we're going to actually spend our public money to support a private venture that can't make money and doesn't serve either the public or the climate is, it amazes me that this is still on the agenda. Progressive Rail projected 3,000 rail cars a year in 2022. Not Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sharnataro. Uh, our next speaker is the Fort Zoom host. And you are on mute. You are muted. Uh, just whoever's on the end of that line, uh, just we can't hear you. You want to press uh, star six or unmute on your. Good Zoom. morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Hi. I'm. I apologize for the identification. Uh, my name is Mark Masidi Miller. 
And I am speaking today as an individual, but I want to applaud and second Mr. Nelson's comments regarding CO2 and climate change. It should be obvious to everyone that there is no silver bullet that's going to solve the climate crisis that threatens the health and safety of, of everyone on the planet. However, there is silver buckshot that we can release in the fight against global warming. Part of that silver buckshot is to transform our transportation system from a car-centric polluting system to one that takes advantage of a robust public transportation system and gets people out of cars and reduces our CO2 output. It is past time for everyone involved in the transportation business to recognize that transportation accounts for more than half of the greenhouse gas emissions in our county. And we had better get to work on transforming our transportation system as fast as we can. Our very lives and the lives of our children and our grandchildren depend on it. We are counting on you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masidi Miller. Our next speaker is Jack Brown. Good morning, Commission. Thank you. This is Jack Brown, a resident of uh, Aptos. The county's report on the Greenway Initiative released yesterday afternoon is revealing. It covers fiscal impact, internal consistency of the county's general and specific plans, including the housing element, consistency between planning and zoning, impact on land use and location of housing, and the county's ability to meet its regional housing needs. Impact on the funding for infrastructure, impact on the community's ability to attract and retain businesses and employment, impact on ag lands, open space and traffic congestion, and the impact on the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. The conclusions of the report are in line with what the Regional Transportation Commission staff has been saying. There are no surprises in this report. That's another conclusion that the Greenway Initiative has no negative impacts on any of the factors studied. And we ha will have positive impacts from lower costs to build a trail, ability to attract competitive grants for active transportation, and the fact that current repairs to the tracks exceed the RTC's current and foreseeable budget capacity. It is also important to note that all the hysteria generated by some members of the commission, the Greenway Initiative, as the report clearly says, is not inconsistent with parks, recreation, and public facilities element, with the noise element, the housing element, the planning and zoning. The county also does not have any specific plans which would be inconsistent with the Greenway Initiative. I think it's high time to stop the misinformation by some commissioners. Thankfully, the voters will be able to make the informed decision on the Greenway Initiative, which is consistent with the county's current general and specific plans. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this is a uh, last call for speakers for oral communications. I don't see any other hands up. And so with that, we will move on and I will ask the staff, are there any additions or changes to today's agenda? There's no changes to the agenda. However, there are a few handouts. There are handouts for items number seven, nine, 23A and 26. And those are all posted on our website. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to our consent agenda. All items appearing on the consent agenda uh, will be acted upon in one motion if no member of the RTC or the public wishes an item to be removed and discussed as a regular item. Uh, and members of the commission can ask questions now or seek clarification, add directions to consent items without removing those items. I will ask uh, first ask commissioners uh, if 
you have any uh, items you would like to pull from the consent agenda. This is item number four through 21. And are there members, I do see hands up. Are there members of the public, uh, are you um, uh, wanting us to pull an item or are you wanting to speak to an item? Um, I guess I'll, I'll start with, um, I'll just go to the public and ask those questions. Madam, Madam Chair, yes. I, don't, I don't think the public has the right to speak to items unless they're pulled. In other words, other um, we actually do allow uh, members to speak to items before we move the entire consent agenda and at the RTC, members may request that an item okay. be pulled. Okay, thank you. Um, I am reading from a script a little bit. <laughs> I'll take your word for it, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, um, so we do have two members of the public with your hands raised, I'll, I'll go out, I'll take it out to the public, not hearing any um, anything from commissioners on items uh, to be pulled. And our first uh, speaker, it will be Trin Craxel. Thank you, Chair and members of the commission. Um, I did wanna follow up on some written comments that Fort submitted uh, regarding item seven on the state and federal legislative program. Um, we, this may in fact, our comments may be, be what Commissioner McPherson was referring to in terms of questions about funding and we really support the concept of a, a funding workshop. So um, thank you for that. Uh, Director Preston has repeatedly stated that funding for the development of electric rail system can't be sought until after an EIR is concluded. Um, yet we see funding for transportation projects uh, allocated before an EIR is completed. So it would be very helpful to understand some of those processes. What, um, and so that we can understand what technically has to be completed before funding can be sought for any stage of a rail project on the branch line. We feel that the commission split vote in May of 21 on the adoption of a draft business plan for the TCAA was not a rejection of rail itself, since the majority of the commission voted in February of that year, last year, to accept this, the TCAA study, um, which identified electric light rail as the preferred option for our branch line. The May 21 tie vote was instead, I think, a, a reluctance by some commissioners to move forward at that time due to cost and lack of funding. Uh, in fact, Director Preston said at the time that he would continue to seek funding for the preferred option. Now with an historic amount of rail funding becoming available this year, the commission should be moving quickly to research these new funding opportunities, resolve cost issues, and move the majority's preference for a rail forward. We believe the RTC should immediately direct staff to seek and identify funds, including for Measure D, to undertake the next development and environmental review phase of the electric passenger rail project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Praxel. Our next speaker is Keith Otto. Yeah, sound check, can you hear me okay? We can. Excellent, uh, thanks very much. Keith Otto, County Resident, I want to also comment on item seven, the 2022 legislative program. So these are policies and programs that the commission supports. In particular, on page 33 and 34 of your agenda packet, lists support to expand the authority of the RTC and local entities to increase taxes and fees for transportation projects and to also support efforts to lower the voter thresholds for local transportation funding measures from the two thirds super majority to a simple majority or 55% vote. This is the wrong way to go as it'll only further intensify the division that we have in this county on transportation priorities. We should at the least support the thresholds that we have now, or if anything, actually raise the bar on voter thresholds in order to focus on areas where there is greater agreement. Consider this, last month a commissioner stated that a majority public position would have him rethink his perspective, but not if it was a 51%, 49% split, but if there was a decisive public position. So yes, again, let's focus on areas where there is greatest agreement. And the ask here today is to is not to simply adjust the verb used to describe your action on this item, 
from adopt or accept um, to you know receive, but rather, right, which was done last year as similar concerns were raised, but rather seriously reconsider the commission position on these items. Thanks for listening. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Otto. Our next speaker is Bill Phillips. Yes, good morning. Um, is item nine being pulled or can we talk to item nine right now? You can speak to item nine at this time, yes. Oh, I wanna thank the commission for getting those goats. The goats did a great job on the, on the uh, weed control. And I'm concerned about herbicides that it looks like somebody's gonna come and spray herbicides on our tracks behind our house. And right now there's a lot of trash back there that's more important to cleaning up than spraying herbicides. That's just my opinion, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. So I do not see any additional hands up, so I will bring it back to the commission for uh, discussion and action. Before we do that, I'd, I'd like to ask, there, are, there were a couple of questions um, and uh, given the um, activity of the goats and the follow-up that we're doing, I I'm just wondering, um, Mr. Mendez, uh, uh, Deputy Director Mendez, if you could just make a, a comment about that, um, because I think that we're um, making real progress and I, you know, I wanna make sure the public is clear about how we're um, approaching this. Yes, uh, certainly, uh, uh, Chair Brown. Um, yes, as, as everyone is aware, the commission did um, um, embark on a pilot project to use goats for uh, for vegetation control. They, they uh, uh, did so on about you know, a little over two miles of the rail line um, right away, and um, it, it seems like uh, yeah, the work they did was, was very good. They did a very good job of clearing a lot of vegetation, um, uh, but of course, the goats they don't eat everything, so there there are some things. Uh, out there that uh, still require uh, uh, mowing and um, and the goat uh, contractors also said, well, you also you know want to do some uh, you know some more herbicide uh, using you know the goats um, going before you do uh, the mowing and and any herbicide will will um, have a, a positive impact in terms of you, you won't need as much uh, work to do some additional uh, vegetation removal um, by human and machine power. And then also, you, you know, you'll need less herbicide and probably, you know, lower, low, uh, lower level um, uh, herbicides when they, when they are needed um, uh, and they'll be, you know, more, more effective. Uh, so the, the herbicides that are going to be applied or proposed to be applied uh, would be done by hand. Um, and uh, two, two of those are not considered hazardous per the uh, federal criteria. Uh, one of them has uh, category five uh, hazard, uh, which is uh, the low, lowest level of, um, of, uh, of hazard, um, but it would be applied only to the pompous grass uh, by hand directly uh, at the base of the, of the pompous grass. And that is because the contractor said in order to have you know something that's that's more effective to deal with uh, with the pompous grass that that would be necessary. But certainly with um, you know uh, uh, employing um, you know a variety of vegetation control strategies, including goats, uh, certainly will allow the ERTC to better maintain the vegetation on the line and be less reliant on any. Um, uh, herbicides that, uh, you know, but, but at some points, you know, sometimes it will be necessary to apply some herbicides. Thank you, uh, Deputy thank Director you. Mendez. Uh, so I, I just want to say uh, thank you for all of the work that, you know, staff has done to really work towards reducing both the quantity and the toxicity levels of <laughs> the, um, the herbicides that we are using and for uh, taking this step with the goats. I think we are making progress. And of course, I'm very much interested in a full transition to um, non, non toxic uh, approaches. And, um, I, and I think that we've, we've, um, we're doing a great job. And I just want to thank you, Director Mendez, Deputy Director Mendez, in particular, for your work on this. Um, I, I also want to make one quick comment, and I, I see hands up from commissioners. Um, but just in response to 
Commissioner McPherson's comments about uh, and, and then a member of the public supporting that, uh, looking at trying to do some kind of workshop or 101 on transportation funding. And I think that's a, a wonderful idea. I will follow up with staff to uh, try to work something out to, to make that happen and on a future agenda. So I, I didn't want to leave that hanging. Uh, and with that, I will call on Commissioner Caput. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to make a motion for approval of the consent agenda. And a quick comment, it was good to hear Jack Nelson's uh, voice again. We, I miss seeing you, man. Anyway, uh, hope you're doing well. We'll get together and we'll talk. Thanks, Jack. Okay, we have a motion. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand. You were on mute. I was just going to second the motion. I'll second that. Oh, oh. oh my God, he already did. That's great. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. And so I will ask now for a roll call vote on uh, the consent agenda. Commissioner Bertrand? I agree. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Lowell Hurst? Aye. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Parker? Aye. And Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. That was unanimous. Okay. Thank you. So we'll now move on to item 22, commissioner reports. And we're we're moving through this agenda quickly. Commissioner McPherson, you could have <laughs> done your, your announcement here, um, but I'll ask if, if others have uh, any reports you'd like to give to, to us today. Commissioner Hurst. Yes, I just wanted to report that the uh, Vision Zero uh, Watsonville crew has uh, met recently and we've got a whole big list of, of transportation, pedestrian and uh, bike friendly uh, suggestions and uh, plans coming up uh, in the Pajaro Valley. And, you know, let's just get everybody moving and uh, folks need to get to work and they need to get home as well and materials need to get to where they belong and uh, where they came from as well. So. I'm committed to uh, trying to move uh, the RTC agenda forward and make sure our residents in the Pajaro Valley have uh, equity and opportunities uh, with their families as well. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so in the um, consent agenda, it mentioned re supporting me as CRCC member and I've attended three meetings so far. Uh, the main issue with the CRCC is uh, commuter traffic on the, the San Francisco Bay side of this peninsula, potentially all the way down to Salinas and maybe beyond. Um, but we do have some interaction with TAMC, and as things come up there, I'll report on that. As you know, they would like to do a station um, in the Paro area and transportation uh, south from there. So. Um, that's an issue that they're working on. Uh, we've been supportive of that, uh, the RTC. And as those actions come forward, I'll bring that up. And um, I was so motivated by the discussion that I'm going to uh, take my wife and I to um, Santa Barbara, no, so San Luis Obispo for uh, an evening. There's great restaurants there, and you can take the rail line down there. It's, it's quite a wonderful ride, I've been told. Um, I was a long commuter from San Francisco to Sunnyvale using the SB, so I do appreciate lines when they do offer that kind of convenience. And um, I think it would be a great date night or a great date weekend. So, uh, see you. and very romantic to anyone who recently got married, I think. See you later. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Bertrand. Are there any other commissioners? Uh, yes. Commissioner Rockin. I was just going to suggest to Jacques that he might want to tell people the full name of what CRCC stands for. Um, you know, my memory nodule is not working as well as it should oh, be. Oh, I'm sorry. I will, re I will <laughs> report on that. The Real Forty Council. Yeah. Yes. That's, yes. <laughs> Thank the you, Louise. Council. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean to hit a sore spot there. Sorry. No, no, that's, that's, 
I mean, they are seriously working on extending commuter traffic south. And it's, it's not just a minor effort, it's a major effort. And as some people report, there's more money available. And I think uh, where something's actually, actually active right now, the money will probably get used there. So I'll, I'll report as more comes up. Thank you, Commissioner Bertrand. We appreciate your service uh, to that uh, rail coordinating committee. Uh, I um, I don't see any other hands up. I just wanted to make a quick uh, comment about the uh, bicycle incentive, uh, electric bicycle incentive programs that um, are be, have been offered by uh, the Central Coast Energy uh, Board, and also I, I've just recently returned to the Monterey, Monterey Bay Air Resources District Board, and at our last meeting we had a conversation about the uh, e-bike incentive program through that uh, through that uh, body. Uh, these are incentives for uh, low-income uh, people uh, in the county who, and in the, in actually beyond the county, um, in the region who are interested in purchasing an EV bike. Uh, these incentives are uh, stackable. The MBARD. Uh, uh, incentive is $1,000, and you can stack that on with the 3CE Central Coast uh, Community Energy Incentives. Um, and with that, um, it's a pretty good deal. Uh, we have uh, increased the um, uh, or changed the, the requirements, the low-income requirements that um, to make it a, a little bit easier for folks to access those incentive programs. So I encourage people to check those out um, and you can find information about the MBARD uh, incentive program. It's right there at the top if you just go to MBARD, M-B-A-R-D dot org. Um, so a, a re really great incentives uh, for getting people moving on electric bikes uh, at a uh, uh, more affordable price. And I will now, seeing no other comments, move on to our next item. That is our director's reports. Uh, Mr. Preston, Thank you're you, up. Madam, thank you, Madam Chair and commissioners and members of the public. Um, I have a couple of announcements to make today. Um, uh, first is regarding the county-wide active transportation plan. The County of Santa Cruz has released a draft active transportation plan for public review which will be used to ident identify needed investments and improvements in the county's walking and bicycling infrastructure. The active transportation plan updates previous work to improve bicycle infrastructure and will represent the first comprehensive plan for pedestrian facilities in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. It provides community identified needs as well as recommendations to support and encourage walking and biking, including possible funding sources. The goal is to support a healthy community, improve affordable transportation options for low income and vulnerable residents, and help the county achieve statewide, statewide goals to address climate change by reducing vehicle miles traveled. Uh, active transportation is really the uh, best way of reducing uh, carbon emissions. Uh, public comment received by March 25th will be reviewed and may be incorporated into the final draft document, which will be presented to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, my second announcement is um, uh, regarding the retirement of RTC Senior Planner Ginger Dykar. I am both uh, saddened by the retirement of an outstanding and dedicated employee, but also excited for Ginger to be moving into a new and rewarding chapter of her life. As customary, there is a resolution to honor Ginger which provided as a handout to today's agenda. And I'm going to read from that uh, resolution and then uh, hand it back over to you, Chair Brown, uh, uh, to see if there's a motion to approve. Uh, regarding Ginger, uh, whereas Ms. Dykar will retire on March 4th, that's tomorrow, 2022, after more than 12 years of extraordinary service to the Santa Cruz County community, I say Santa Cruz, County Regional Transportation Commission employee, and whereas Ginger Dykar, Senior Transportation Planner, began her career with the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission on June 1st, 2009, as an intern, advancing the RTC's mapping, transportation monitoring, and greenhouse gas emission performance measurement capabilities. 
And whereas during her tenure, Ms. Diker has earned the respect and admiration of commissioners, management, coworkers, colleagues, and community members for her demonstration, demonstrated professionalism, dedication, understanding, tenacity, cooperation, work ethic, caring, and enthusiasm to improve transportation in Santa Cruz County. And whereas during her tenure at the RTC, Ms. Diker has managed and played an essential role in advancing many projects and programs, managing major planning efforts, including the Regional Transportation Plan, the Unified Corridor Investment Study and Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis, and demonstrating outstanding grant writing skills, securing millions of dollars for trail, highway, and other projects in Santa Cruz County. And whereas, as a coworker, Ms. Dykar has been a well-respected team member, team leader, and mentor, displaying great cooperation, coordination, compassion, encouragement, enthusiasm, generosity, teamwork, and tenacity work effort. And whereas Ms. Dykar has served the people of Santa Cruz County with the highest level of loyalty, integrity, respect, professionalism, dedication, and she will be missed by all. Therefore, it shall be resolved by the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission that we, the members of the RTC board, do hereby recommend Ginger Dykar, recommend Ginger Dykar for her more than 12 years of dedicated and exceptional service to the community of Santa Cruz County with the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. We further extend our sincerest and most grateful appreciation and best wishes for many years of great health, much happiness, and immense prosperity in her well-earned retirement. With that, I hand it back over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Preston. Yes, um, round of applause. Um, uh, so yeah, I see that there are uh, members of the commission who would like to uh, speak and I also will entertain a motion. I um, and Commissioner Rock, and I see your hand. I, I'm gonna go in order that I saw them go up. Um, sure. uh, Co Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, I, I just wanna say, uh, Ginger, um, having been a uh, member of RTC for 10 years now, she has been a tremendous asset, especially in the grant writing uh, uh, element of our, of our program. Uh, she has been just professional and forward looking all throughout. Uh, she's been just terrific for the RTC and for the people of Santa Cruz County. And I really wanna thank her for her dedicated service. It's much appreciated. You're, you're an outstanding person and we're gonna miss you. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. I, I want to remind the commissioners that we are also looking for a motion to approve this resolution. Um, I'd like to make that motion. But I wanted to give you that opportunity. <laughs> um, I have a point of procedure. Yes, Commissioner. Um, I have a question for staff. When this resolution was put on the agenda? It was on the agenda from uh, the original agenda and then it was the resolution itself was provided as a handout um uh yesterday i believe but it's part of the staff re uh, the executive director's report correct yes it is so it wasn't a separate item on the agenda i, I have um i totally support everything that commissioner mcpherson is saying i think i'm very saddened that ginger is leaving i think she's a tremendous asset to the commission but I have a, a Brown Act concern about adding an item to the agenda without public notice. Um, and there, as I understand it, there needs to be 72 hours notice. So, you know, I, I, I wonder if Steve could weigh in on this because my suggestion is if we can do a motion today, I would second it. If we can't under the Brown Act do a motion today, I would continue this to our next meeting so that it could be on the consent agenda for approval, because I, I think it's, you know, I, I know it's a little picky and it's not controversial, but um, I, I'm just concerned that where we need to give public notice, we give public notice. So Mr. Mattis, can you weigh in on this, please? Uh, I can, um, Mr. Preston, this is this is part of your executive director's report, correct? This That was the anticipated placement of this, correct? Yes, and it was listed um, and provided with more than 72 
hours notice um, when the agenda was posted. However, the resolution itself was not um, posted itself the material until yesterday. Um, as long as as long as it was listed and referenced, it is appropriate that commission can act on it today. The I'll the resolution is motion, then. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a motion in a second, and I see Commissioner Rotkin has a hand up. I just wanted to add to all the list of uh, positive attributes which we've, with which I totally agree to talk about Ginger's accessibility to commission members and the public. Um, for someone who's doing really high level work that involves you know, often <laughs> going into the weeds to, to find statistics and information and process various kinds of very complex processes, it's great to have somebody who really can explain things clearly to the public and then has such a commitment to getting the public involved in the decisions that we have to make as a commission. So I just, just wanted to add that. I don't, I don't want to change the resolution. I think it's got this, you can find probably words in there to attach that thought to, but I just think that that the uh, Ginger's work in that area has just really been fantastic and deserves some uh, specific re recognition. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rotkin. I, um, I, let's see, I see uh, that Deputy Director Mendez has a hand up as well. I'll um, call on you next. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I've, I've been extremely fortunate to uh, work with Ginger the entire time there at the, at the RTC. And I remember when I first uh, met Ginger, she was um, seeking to volunteer with the RTC to help with some of our, ma our mapping work. And she actually ended up establishing our mapping <laughs> at the RTC. Um, and uh, when I first met her and I, and I reviewed her resume, my uh, immediate reaction wa was, why would she want to volunteer at the RTC when it was abundantly clear that she could do so much more? And to the great fortune of the RTC, she decided to volunteer at the RTC and do so much, much more than that. So I'm extremely grateful, Ginger, for all, all your great work. And, uh, and you've been a tremendous, you know, you've done, you made tremendous contributions, not just to the RTC, but to the community as a whole. So thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Dykar, I see your hand is up. We do have a few more uh, commissioners and a member of the public who wanted to say a couple of words. So I'll, I do wanna give you a chance to address the commission and, and the public in just a moment, if that's all right. Okay, um, so uh, let's see, we have, so Commissioner Hurst. Yes, I just wanna say uh, thanks to uh, Ms. Dykar and her uh, long standing support for all our transportation projects in the Pajaro Valley. She has really proved to be a, a great friend of our residents uh, south of Freedom Boulevard and north as well. So I just wanted to congratulate her and thank her for her long and distinguished service. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I do see a member of the public. Uh, so I, I wanna call on uh, Sally for Rail and Trail uh, before we give Ginger the floor. Thank you. Um, I just have to say that I'm just so sad to see that Ginger is leaving. Um, you know, as everybody's talked about, you know, she's been, she's very professional and smart. She's done a lot of great things, but she's also very kind and respectful when she's talking with those of us in the public who are interested in these issues. And, um, and that is very appreciated and is rarer than you might think. Um, and we, um, we're really gonna miss Ginger and I know there've been challenges and I'm really sorry that you've decided to leave the RCC. I think it's gonna be a real loss, but um, I really hope that you, uh, you, know, you, des you deserve uh, to put together the life you want. And um, I just thank you very much for all your service on the commission. The community has really benefited from your service at the RTC, even the people who don't know you're there and what you're doing, but but some of us really see you and really appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. With that, I will uh, turn the floor over to Ms. Dykar to uh, share some thoughts with us. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for your kind words of appreciation. It's my time at the RTC has been some of the most rewarding work experiences of my career. And it's really hard to believe that I've been there. It's, um, I was thinking it was 12, but uh, Louise reminded me, that's actually 13, Ginger. <laughs> You've been here for 13 years. 
Um, I've worked in a lot of different places. I've worked in academic institutions. I've been a consultant, uh, obviously as a government employee, not only here, but in other places as well. And I just really wanna make sure, um, you know, that I get across that the caliber of people at the RTC staff is some of the most um, professional and dedicated to serving the Santa Cruz County community. They're some of the best people I've worked with over the many years of my career. I've really been honored to be part of the RTC team. I'm really proud of what we have achieved there. And I know um, Director Preston went over some of that, but I, I would love to just spend a couple minutes to just go over in these last 13 years, what we have achieved at the RTC during my tenure and um, as with myself as the project manager. The regional transportation plan took a new direction in bringing performance measure target setting and monitoring to work toward a sustainable transportation system for Santa Cruz County. The unified corridor investment study was completed to determine the best investments for the main east-west corridors in the county, Highway 1, SoCal, and the rail corridor. As part of the unified corridor study, prior to the actual planning study, RTC staff worked with the consultant team to develop the Santa Cruz County travel demand model, which has been used by the RTC in both the unified corridor study, the transit corridor alternatives analysis, which we couldn't have done without this um, Santa Cruz County travel demand model. And the County of Santa Cruz has utilized the model as well in updating their general plan. And we have this as a tool for our community now, which is incredibly helpful in working to in the future. RTC, as part of the, um, so RTC was awarded over 100 million on the Senate Bill 1 program to Solutions for Congested Corridors and Local Partnership Program for the Highway 1 Auxiliary Lanes and Bus on Shoulders Project, as well as numerous bike and pedestrian improvements on SoCal. And the Unified Corridor Study was critical in, in securing this funding as it was required to have a corridor plan to be considered for these funds. The Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis was completed with much discussion on the various ways the rail corridor should be used. None of these projects were straightforward, but we were successful, not only as RTC staff as a team, but as a commission to bring these projects forward as best we could. I wanna take a minute now to just call out one person in particular for my appreciation, and that is Deputy Director Luis Mendez. Luis has been my supervisor all 13 years at the RTC. I wanna thank you, Luis for trusting me to do the work that I was needed to get my projects completed. You knew that if I needed your input, I would come walk in and knock on your door um, and your mentoring over the years, sharing your knowledge of transportation planning and the history of the agency was really invaluable in my development as a transportation planner. You were always available for me. I just needed to come down and, and find you. And I, I very much appreciate that, Louise. I always felt respected working for you. Thank you to all, all of you, for your desire to put all of our skills together to better our community. This is really a case of it takes a village to get these projects completed. I know I will look back on this time with so many fond memories. Thank you for all for working so hard to make Santa Cruz County a friendlier place to get around. Your work is incredibly important, particularly now as we deal with the climate crisis. I wanted to say just one thing to the Watsonville community. One of my plans in retirement, I have a lot of hobbies. And one of them is creating mosaics. I've been um, volunteering with Kathleen Crochetti on the Watsonville Briante project. I just incredibly love that project. It is so fantastic for the community of Watsonville in so many different ways. And that's pretty much first on my list to get back there and try to volunteer on a weekly basis. It's really a fantastic project. You're really fortunate to have Kathleen Crochetti in your community. And I just feel like um, I just value the ability to support the Watsonville community in that way. So thank you. Appreciate your, your kind words. Thank you so much, uh, Ginger. You are, you know, just, you really will be missed um, uh, at the commission. Uh, your professionalism, your accessibility, and your commitment to our community, all, all of the um, adjectives that came up in the resolution. I, as I was listening, I kept thinking, okay, there's one more, I'm going to use it, and it was covered, And uh, but all of it is really true, and uh, you will be missed, and uh, we look forward to hearing about your new adventures and, and seeing the, the mosaic um, develop. 
Um, congratulations. And uh, with that, I will, um, let's see, we have a motion on the floor and I'll, I'll open that up for a, a vote on the resolution. Before I take the roll call, I just want to say, Ginger, I'm so going to miss you. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand. I definitely agree. Commissioner Brown. Aye, aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Alternate uh, Hurst. Enthusiastically, yes. Commissioner Caput. Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn. Yes. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Aye. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Parker. Aye. Commissioner Rockin. Aye. It was unanimous. Okay, thank you, everyone. Up next, we have our Caltrans report, and I will turn that over to Mr. Eads. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. I'll start by saying um, we have really appreciated Ginger's work as well, and so we're going to miss you, Ginger. Thank you. Um, next thing I wanted to talk about is um, District 5, Caltrans District 5 has released our new active transportation plan that covers um, all of our bicycle and pedestrian facilities on state highway district wide. Um, it can be found at catplan.org. You could do forward slash district five, um, or just you'll find it if you go to catplan.org. Um, it provides, um, it's really a two part uh, compendium of um, one is a, a written document. Um, recording in progress a tool to help us move in that direction um, and also to look forward to partnering with um, a number of different entities to help make sure that we are moving forward with active transportation systems that really work for our residents next thing i want to mention is a couple of clean california announcements first district five has reached its goal um, between july 2021 through june 22 um, well, I should say we're moving forward with our goal. We're about 72% complete. We've removed 13,000 cubic yards of litter as of um, beginning of February. Um, we have a total goal of 18,000, um, but the 13,000 that we've achieved so far equates to 885 garbage trucks um, being full with trash being removed from our roadways in District 5, state highways in District 5. So that's a significant achievement. Last thing I wanted to mention is that the governor announced this week the Clean California Local Grant Program Awards, and two projects were selected in Santa Cruz County. The first is in the city of Santa Cruz, and it's the main beach restrooms. The um, grant amount was $727,000, and it's going to complete renovation of the Main Street public ref restrooms, um, upgrading those facilities to be ADA compliant, water conserving fixtures, and a number of other things. It also includes picnic tables. Uh, trash and recycling receptacles and signage to discourage littering. Second project is the, San the County of Santa Cruz. It was the Green Valley Road Multi-Use Trail Improvement Project. The grant amount on that is $5 million, and it will be upgrading an existing pedestrian trail with pervious two-way um, or two-way trail system, multi-use to provide safe, accessible connectivity between the city of Watsonville and Santa Cruz. It's a two-mile long path, 10, 10 feet in width. It also includes educational programs, um, community events, and art installations. So I just wanted to, in summary, just highlight that there were 18 grant awards submitted within Caltrans District 5. Five were awarded, um, two of them within Santa Cruz County, 
the total grant amount awarded in District 5 was just over 10 million. And um, so congrats to city and county staff for capturing a sizable portion of that. That concludes my report, happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Eads. I see uh, Commissioner McPherson has a hand up. Following yeah, up. Thank you, I just, uh, thank you for your report. I just wanna point out how excited I am that the wildlife undercrossing uh, Highway 17 at Royal Curve has begun. That was one of the two earmarks, the other one being the uh, stretch between the San Lorenzo Valley School Complex and Felton that was earmarked in Measure D. It is terrific to have that start for in the interest of public safety and wildlife protection. And I'm really excited that this is underway. Thank you very much. Thank you voters of Santa Cruz County for including this in Measure D. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Caput. Yeah, thank you, uh, Scott, thanks a lot. Uh, Appreciate uh, we're, we're ready to go on Highway 152 and Houlihan and College Road. Uh, that's something we've been working on for about 10 years. And uh, I think we finally got the funding and uh, we solved some of the uh, uh, eminent domain problems that we, uh, we were able to do it outside of eminent domain. Uh, thank you for all your work. Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the report. And I want to echo uh, Commissioner McPherson's uh, comments about uh, Highway 17 under crossing. I had a question about the active transportation plan. Uh, the plan includes a variety of projects throughout the county. And I guess uh, my, I'm not sure the question is for you, uh, Mr. Eads, or for RTC staff, but I just wanted to make sure that if appropriate, those projects are also in the regional transportation plan. If I may clarify, Madam Chair. Yes, please. Um, the plan actually does not include projects. If we're talking about the R active, the District 5 Caltrans active transportation plan, it identifies needs and areas of needs that we will be looking to target with projects, but the, the specific solutions for each location are not yet identified but it does identify needs at this point in time. But to the degree we are starting to move into projects and we have clarity on specific locations, and we do in many locations that are already identified and reflected in the regional transportation plans. Um, so yes, to the degree we already have a solution in mind, those should already be in the regional transportation plans. Um, to the degree that those evolve and we have clarity on what the solutions will be, then we will need to work with um, RTC staff to include those in the future updates. So I read an active transportation plan that uh, Ecology Action put out. Is that a different active trans transportation plan than the one you're talking about? Yes, this was released by Caltrans District 5. So this is an effort that we've been working on on the past, past few years. It was a consultant led effort and um, it's specific to state highways in District 5. I see. Okay, Santa so Christa. the county has its own active transportation plan going through the process. All right, well, I guess so. we have a few ATPs going down. Uh, I had another question about the uh, grant, the Clean California grant for the trail in South County. Um, is that funding source? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that project. I assume it's not part of the rail trail, um, but I wonder whether Clean California grants could be used to help fund uh, rail trail segments. So I'll, I'll I'll clarify what I know, and that is that this is an existing trail, and the project will be rehabilitating the trail and bringing it, um, you know, really making it approved rideable surface, um, and some other things associated with it. Um, the Clean California program wasn't necessarily focused towards active transportation improvements, and I will say also that project also includes beautification with landscaping and other things. Um, the, the funding source was really targeted to beautification. So it could have been used for parks or roadways, um, but it was aimed at beautification and, and trash removal, educational campaigns and the like. So um, while in theory, somebody could have applied for a new rail trail facility, um, it probably wouldn't have competed well just because of the overall cost of the project. Uh, considering the other candidates that were um, in the mix. 
Of course, some of us think the rail trail is a beautiful beautification project, but I, I hear what you're saying. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so I have a question, Scott. Um, so we just approved some legislation in earlier vote, and one of the things there was um, a state uh, effort to um, deal with underutilized byways and turn them into multimodal corridors. And so I'm trying to understand what that definition might be, and from your understanding, do we have any underutilized byways in Santa Cruz that would qualify? I'm actually, through the chair, if I may, um, I'm actually not aware of that legislation, so it'd be helpful to maybe have a little bit more information about that specific legislation, um, because there's probably some sort of a definition that I'm not aware of that they're using. Okay, well, it's on eight, uh, page 8.3 of the agenda. So. Okay, sorry, I'll check that out. Thanks. Okay, uh, Commissioner Hurst. I just want to thank uh, Mr. Eves for his uh, work with uh, Caltrans and all our uh, highway intersections in uh, in the Pajaro Valley, Highway 1, Highway 129, and Highway 152. We've got a lot of mileage uh, here in the Pajaro Valley, and there's always a great need for beautification and litter control. And I want to thank our partners at Caltrans for their work also in our downtown to make uh, our downtown more pedestrian and bike friendly and uh, and support businesses too. Thank you very much. Commissioner Rotkin. I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, thank Scott and Caltrans for the way in which the agency has really transformed its approach to transportation issues over the last decade. Um, there was a time I think when Caltrans was seen as focused purely on the automobile in, in the most narrow kind of uh, engineering way. And the, the responsiveness on the Highway 9 project uh, in Santa Cruz, the, the, the uh, working with the local the county uh, and the, the neighborhood, uh, really a different kind of approach than we've received in the past. And I think the example of working on the uh, Highway 17 uh, underpass for wildlife, you know, where the private sector group, the um, um, uh, in, in our county, really, uh, the land trust uh, really demonstrates a, a responsiveness to sort of public, uh, changing public ideas about what's important in our society. And uh, it, I, it's re I really feel um, we're really well served by Caltrans in general, not not also in the area of the automobile where that's necessary, but but uh, this just really re represents the fact that the, it's a supple agency that's begun to really respond to people's needs rather than simply set on a goal in a narrow way that doesn't respond well to the public. So thank you. I would uh, hear here. I, I would echo Commissioner Rockin's comments. Uh, really appreciate. Um, your work, your participation in uh, our commission, and um, and the, all of the things that Caltrans is doing to um, support local communities in their efforts to um, promote active transportation and uh, sustainable infrastructure, as well as those services. Um, I see, uh, let's see, Director Preston, you have uh, comments, questions? Yeah, I've heard a lot of comment today about the wildlife crossing, and I was hoping to make an announcement today about a groundbreaking ceremony, but there's been so much interest um, from our uh, state legislators, including from the governor's office, that we've had to postpone it to try to get schedules to correspond. So I wanted to um, assure um, the commission that as soon as we have a date for a groundbreaking ceremony, that we'll be putting out an announcement. Great, thank you for that. So look for the announcement. I do, let's see, do I, I do not see any members of the public who have any comments on this item. So we will move on to our next item. This is an update from the city of Santa Cruz. Our city engineer, uh, Nathan Wynn, will give us a report. And I think I saw. Mr. Wynn, yes, there you are. Uh, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, RCC commissioners and the public. Uh, my name is Nathan Wen. I'm the city engineer for the city of Santa Cruz. And um, today I have a little slideshow <clears throat> for you guys to present uh, transportation project updates that the city uh, public works team is working on. Pull it up right now. And I'm just confirming that you guys can see that. Yes, we see. Okay, perfect. Okay, so. Um, Next slide here. So here's just a brief overview of the uh, presentation for today. Um, I thought I'd break it down to three different parts, you know, past construction, uh, present and future. So projects that were recently completed in the last year, um, and then projects with shovels and USA markings that are on the ground currently in the city. And then projects that we're looking forward to getting into construction uh, in the near future. Um, and what I'll say about this, uh, all these projects is that, you know, the city of Santa Cruz is, you know, we mentioned it before about active transportation. We are very committed to active transportation here. And as I go through this presentation, you'll see that each one of these projects has bike and pedestrian, you know, improvements uh, throughout. And so we'll continue that tradition here. Okay. So past projects. Uh, okay. So. In 2021, uh, we had our overlay project. Uh, the city of Santa Cruz maintains uh, 136 miles of paved streets. Um, mainly, we rehabilitate those projects using city uh, measure H, as well as uh, the regional measure D funds. Um, right now, we're, we're, our PCI, our pavement condition index, is running about 65 on our arterial roadways, but it's been declining uh, year by year uh, over the past four years. And so even with these measures, we're just keeping up maintaining our roadways. Uh, this project right here completed 0.82 miles of paved streets. It was completed uh, in September of 21 uh, by a contractor, MCK Service out of Martinez. And then some of the streets that you can see right there, um, some of the notable improvements that we were able to get uh, with regards to active transportation were like on Fairmont, we added new curb ramps and new high visibility crosswalks, the continental crosswalks. I like to call those the piano key uh, crosswalks. Um, Market Street also got some new green back shared, shared lane markings, also known as Sharrows, commonly known as Sharrows. And some radar feedback, uh, radar speed feedback signs. So uh, if you ever bike commuted along Market Street in the city of Santa Cruz, um, there's a curve there. There's no bike lanes, unfortunately. It's a tight, narrow right away. But we've added some, you know, speed signs to help reduce speeds, and then the green markings to, you know, help encourage bikes to take the full lane. And then Delaware, uh, a really active street, uh, high collector corridor, uh, collector street, uh, also received refreshes from Sharrows. Um, I should also note too that uh, the city has completed some recent traffic uh, work orders where we're installing some more Sharrows that are along uh, De La Viega and Prospect Heights uh, down to uh, Harbor High, as well as uh, De La Viega Elementary School. So those are those are coming. coming. Uh, this next project that we completed last year, uh, completed in September of uh, 2021 by Pavement Coatings, was our surface seal project. Uh, it included 37 local and residential roadways. Um, it completed about 3.51 miles of surface seal. And a surface seal was we put a slurry down with a chip seal, some, some aggregate, and then a finished top of microsurface that goes on top of it. So it's a three layer system um, that we use mainly for our local roadways. Um, right here, you'll see a photo of uh, in the background there of um, Delaware, where it turns into Laguna. And again, Delaware being uh, a major collector in the city, we were excited to be able to install protected and buffered bike lanes on certain sections of Delaware where the right of way allowed. Uh, this, this project's um, cost is right there, 830000 and funded with uh, Measure D and local funds. Next, we have um, the Pacific Avenue sidewalk project. This one we were really excited about. And so if you've ever been down to the, the boardwalk or the wharf, um, you know, we've had uh, a missing piece of sidewalk for, for, for decades or forever. And we're really happy to complete this project um, last September as well. Um, it's 180 lineal feet of sidewalk and new bike lane. And it really is a critical piece that gets uh, all the, the, the folks, whether you're local or tourists, down into that beach area. 
Um, some, some notable improvements that we also were able to solve was there was flooding. So if you ever drove by there in the winter time when we used to have rain, uh, you'd see that we had a low spot in the roadway and it would flood and regularly. Um, so we were able to put some new storm drain pipes, regrade the curb and gutter out there with this new uh, 10 foot wide sidewalk, add street trees, uh, decorative sidewalk, um, decorative lighting, again, all matching the themes in that, in that area. Um, what was also really a nice improvement is that we coordinated pretty close, we coordinated closely with Metro at Meta Mountain site you know, during the design phase. Uh, we actually relocated their bus stop. So it was actually at the intersection uh, where Pacific and Front meets. Uh, and, and it actually improves the, the access, uh, again, for people unloading and loading to get down to the beach, as well as for the bus drivers when they're crossing the intersection, they have um, some more maneuvering room to get in and out of that bus stop. Um, we also felt that uh, it was worth the improvement to add a concrete bus pad there as well. So uh, it will last over time. I'll be excited about that. Okay. Uh, and then last uh, project I wanted to show that we've recently completed was uh, Rail Trail Segment 7 Phase 1. Um, this stretches from Natural Bridges Drive to Bay and California Avenue. It's a 1.3 miles long, 12 to 16 foot wide multi use trail. Um, some of, the, some of the cool things that kind of in the design part that came out of it was this cross bike striping, which uh, encourages bikes to stay on their bike when crossing the roadways. And then we also had a cycle track, a two-way uh, cycle track on Bay Street, uh, utilizing the, the existing roadways to connect um, different trail segments. We were able to add some bike counters, bike and ped counters uh, with this project. And um, based on what we're seeing right now, it's about 600 daily users. Um, that's what you'd probably see right now in the winter months. Um, but last summer, we were up at peaks of uh, about 2,400 on, on weekends. So you could tell when it was really nice, people were coming and really utilizing that trail. Um, and so we hope, I expect to, we hope to see, you know, those numbers actually increase uh, in time uh, with the further development of the other segments. Um, this one had a, a lot of different funding sources. Uh, the cost was 6.4 million. You know, we used city and RCT, RTC measure D had a federal earmarks and stip and some local funds. Um, and then the last thing I'll say to you is as far as those users, it really is split between bikes and pets. It, when we look at the data, it's 50-50. There's not overwhelmingly a number of bikes or overwhelming number of pets uh, using the rail trail. It's really, it really is a great uh, mixed use uh, facility. Okay. So uh, current construction, here's a picture of um, the northeast corner of Highway 19. Uh, and then this project, Highway 19, um, is about increasing the capacity through uh, this intersection. I apologize, I, I meant to look up the volume, but I do know that this is the busiest intersection in the city of, or in the county of Santa Cruz. Um, what this project is going to do is add a northbound uh, lane on Highway 9, a southbound lane on Highway 9, as well as a southbound lane on Highway 1. Um, this is going to improve uh, the capacity of the uh, folks coming out of, uh, you know, the Harvey West or, or, or uh, Highway 9 area to get onto southbound Highway 1. Um, we were able to work with Caltrans uh, to get new bike lanes as well, so we're really excited about, uh, again, a new facility to actually get uh, on, on Highway 9. Um, <clears throat> let's see, and then the, it's in construction right now and we estimate completion uh, sometime uh, this summer. So July of 22 is our estimate right now and this is funded by STIP, TIF, and local funds. Uh, next project that we have um, that's gonna start construction actually on Monday. Um, is the Riverwalk Lighting Project. Um, this project was funded by the ATP Cycle 3 program as well as a local match. Uh, this project is um, to install 65 new LED light fixtures along the San Lorenzo River Riverwalk on the east and west bank north of the Water Street Bridge. So between Highway 1 and Water Street on both sides of the river, um, we're adding lights. We'll also be adding lights in um, along the path at San Lorenzo Park. Uh, this project is estimated to also be complete uh, by midsummer, and um, 
will hopefully uh, encourage more people to use this facility both in the early mornings and at night. Uh, this is a great off-roadway active transportation facility. Okay. And future construction. So here's a rendering of uh, segment seven, phase two, uh, which I'll get into here in a second. So uh, segment seven, phase two, you know, ends right where, or begins, I should say, where phase one ends at the intersection of Bay and California. Uh, this section is 0.8 miles long, uh, it is 12 feet wide, and run long, runs along the railway to uh, and ends at Pacific Avenue. Um, bids for this project are expected to go out in the next week or two, so and bids will be due back in early April. Um, this project is funded by ATP Cycle 5 grant, as well as a city and, measure, a city and RTC Measure B. Um, Segment eight and nine is not included in today's presentation, uh, but I do want to let you know that there will be a community open house for segments eight and nine uh, scheduled uh, for the end of the month. We're working on locking down a date and providing details in the next week or so. Um, it will be the first of many public uh, meetings over the next two to three months. So uh, just want to give you guys a heads up on that. Um, next project is the a future project is the Chestnut Storm Drain and Road Rehabilitation uh, Project. Um, this, uh, you may recall, thank you, uh, was approved for STIP funds through uh, your board. So we really appreciate that and uh, are happy to move this project forward as quickly as possible. Uh, it is anticipated to go out to bid uh, tomorrow. Um, this project is roughly $2.1 million of STIP local and measure D funds. Um, some of the exciting things that are going to come out of the of this project will be some protected and buffered bike lanes on Chestnut, and mainly on the downhill portion. If you've ever come into the city from uh, the highway, there uh, speeds are a little fast. Or thank you. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're we're going to narrow down the lanes and add a protected bike lane, at least on the southbound. We're working on seeing if we can get um, manage getting something in the northbound in the future. Um, with these paving projects, uh, the city ends up upgrading a lot of the, or is required to really, to update the curb ramps to be ADA compliant. And with that, um, it's really exciting because we actually get a fresh opportunity to look at improving the crossings, not just from the curb ramps, but from signage, from striping, from lighting. So Chestnut will also get some uh, new sidewalks. Um, some new signage, and then in the future, there will be an, actually an, R, an RRFB, which is a rectangular rapid flashing beacon, a really highly effective device for, for, for yield compliance um, at the corner of uh, Church and, and Chestnut here, and that will be a separate project in the future. Okay. Uh, next project is the Murray Street Bridge Seismic Retrofit. Um, the plans and specs of this project are complete. Uh, city staff is working on obtaining the final permits as well as the right-of-way certification. Uh, we anticipate uh, construction to start uh, this September and, and take about two and a half years. Uh, this, this project is construction portion is anticipated to cost 23.5 million and is fully funded by state and federal grants, the highway bridge program as well as Prop 1B. Um, there'll be different stages of construction uh, when when this goes. Uh, there'll be different stages uh, uh, during the construction process uh, with regards to temporary traffic control. Um, it'll, it'll be dependent on what the contractor submits once we have uh, one acquired. But it is anticipated that the eastbound uh, direction will remain open at most times during construction and that the westbound may be diverted or detoured at times or most of the time. Um, but again, that'll be dependent on once, once we actually take it out to bid and have a contractor submit their traffic control plan for review. Um, city staff is working on creating a dedicated web page for this project in the future. So expect to see something in the coming months to help inform the public of the project's progress and as well as its impacts to the public right away. Um, I've already started beginning the discussions with our regional partners on trying to coordinate our major projects. We're well aware of Pure Water Soquel and RTC and Caltrans, and as well as the county's major projects that are up and coming. 
And so we'll work with them to try to have a unified uh, message messaging for the public uh, with regards to all of our impacts. And kind of on that note, um, my final slide here is a major project map. So the city uh, public works department, we just uh, created this web page. Um, I think it went live on Monday. So there's uh, could be some little tweaks that need to be made, but from uh, the city of Santa Cruz.com webpage, if you search construction, the first link that will pop up is this new major projects map. Um, this map is for major public works projects and does not include minor projects, utility projects, or private development projects. Um, you'll see right there that if you click on the icon, it's GIS based and it'll pull up project information, the title, uh, a project description, estimate, cost estimate, as well as a construction estimate timeline. Um, the hope is that with this, this will help direct the public to the correct project manager and provide some basic information on the project if they should have any additional questions. There's also additional more info link that will actually take you to uh, the pre uh, public works plans and specs uh, project webpage. So if you want more detail on uh, the plans or specs or environmental review, um, you can also go to that uh, more info link. And with that, that um, concludes my presentation for today. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Wen. I will look to the commission for questions. Uh, I see uh, C Commissioner Rotkin and then Commissioner Schifrin. Just a brief comment. I really want to thank the city's public works department and all the others involved in this. As a person who rides my bicycle many times during the week, these projects make a real difference to me in terms of safety. The Chestnut Street improvements, the protected bike lane on, I ride that protected bike lane on Delaware almost daily. And it's so much, it just feels so much safer to ride behind those little, I mean, a car could go over, like, you know, it's not totally protected, but the difference between the way the wild west it was before when, you know, just didn't know whether a car was just going to like not be paying attention and swipe you. It, it just feels so much better. And it's going to make such a big, it already it's making a difference and will make so much more difference in the future. Thank you so much for this work. Commissioner Schifrin. Yeah, I had a question about segment, uh, rail trail segment seven, phase two. Um, mm -hmm. The slide indicated that the project would start this September, but not be completed till March of 2025. Is it really gonna take almost three years to complete the project? Oh, I apologize. Uh, the, the, the slide for segment seven, phase two, say 2025? Mm-hmm. Okay. I uh, know it should only take a year. I apologize. I have to let me, let me take a look at that. Um, no, it should only take. We we we're estimating a twelve months. So it's um, so if a project goes into construction this April, um, we it would last until April of twenty three. Okay, I feel a whole lot better. Thank you very much. Um, and you know the bid release uh, seems to keep getting put off. Is that one or two weeks firm, or is that likely to slide for the bids to be released? We're, we're still waiting on some final quantities, um, but yes, I feel pretty comfortable that we'll be able to get out to bid next week. Thank you very much. And for the presentation, I think it's very helpful to see the status of the project. Thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, I see uh, Commissioner Koenig. You have a question. Thank you, Chair Brown, and thank you, Mr. Wynn, for the presentation. I'm um, excited to see that you added bike counters on um, segment 7A uh, for the rail trail or phase one. Um, it's really cool to have that data as far as bikers and walkers and um, you know, daily active users. Um, so thanks for that. That's good foresight. Uh, I just want to use the opportunity to express um, my, my concern about the Murray Street Bridge project. I mean, as you mentioned, um, the timing in many ways um, couldn't be worse, given that we're, we're at this point looking at construction on all three north-south corridors really at the same time, um, you know, potentially starting the um, auxiliary lane project between Soquel Drive and 41st Avenue this year, resurfacing um, Soquel Drive, 
um, for the bike and pedestrian and, and new signal timing project there. Um, so we're, I mean, it all could start this summer, fall. Um, you know, I, I appreciate that you said you're working with, uh, with county public works on the timing for that. Um, but I, I do have concerns that this could, if not done right, could be Carmageddon. Uh, and, um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a good time to um, take advantage of some of those e-bike rebates that were mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I would say to any extent, I know, I know this bridge project has been in the works for many years and it's going to take several years at least. Um, I mean, if there's any way that it can be delayed a little bit, that would be appreciated. You know, it would make sense to, to begin after the, these capacity expanding projects are done on the highway or on, uh, you know, um, flow improvements are done on SoCal Drive. Um, so not so much a question. I mean, maybe if there's any way you can elaborate on some of the ways you can work with the this county uh, and the RTC on the timing of this, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so uh, I've already been in discussions, some early discussions with the uh, engineering managers over at RTC as well as uh, Pure Water SoCal. Um, we got to start reaching out with the county and talking more about with the SoCal buffer bike lanes and congestion project. Uh, I believe what um, all projects are moving forward and they are moving forward quickly and that it is going to be a challenge to um, maybe manage some of the expectations, but what we're hoping to do is have a more uh, unified uh, page or front so that the you know public can go to one maybe one source to find all this information as opposed to five different agencies because Caltrans, RTC, Pure Water, uh, County, and City um, makes it pretty difficult you know and so um, that we're going to be fleshing that out here in the coming months but yeah we do want to work closely with you guys and uh, the county, uh, as well as, again, the other regional partners to try to have a, a robust kind of information campaign to help folks um, understand all the different projects that are happening and impacts in their neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, again, the timing will be essential. I understand the SoCal Drive project shouldn't have too too much of a prolonged impact, so I don't know if it's a, a situation where you could pause construction on the Murray Street Bridge during that time or, or how you can coordinate, but, you know, um, obviously, it's going to be about most importance for, for anyone trying to commute between uh, North and South County. So thank you. Commissioner Rotkin. This is, I, I, I'm just curious whether there, you're actually looking at the possibility of um, almost daily coordination of the project so that on any given afternoon, for example, one of these routes would be open, um, you know, as opposed to detoured, and that would require that that won't be easy. But you know, because you've got projects that move ahead according to their own logic. But uh, the I I think the point that uh, Ma'am has raised here is an important one, and the the idea that you might on any given day, uh, you know, have a project not uh, pause construction again, not for six months or a year, but for an afternoon. Uh, or, or you know, two days of a week or something, so that that part one of these options might be open to people, as opposed to all three of them being shut down at the exact same time. Yeah, I think that's a good comment. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn. Yeah, I uh, not to be redundant, but is there any way we can see a project timeline and flowchart? What's going to happen? The way to get around the harbor is either SoCal or the Murray Street Bridge. And if they're both tied up simultaneously, the traffic through those neighborhoods will be overwhelming and gridlock. So I think having a plan on how people are gonna get across, around the harbor is gonna be critical. And I, I, I'd like to ask that we see that plan, uh, including what happens in the morning and the afternoon. Um, it, it will be total gridlock and those people in the neighborhood will not be happy. Yeah, um, thank you for the comment. And it is going to be painful, I think, for our community as these projects get rolled out. The Once the project is bidded and a contractor is on board, they'll submit a temporary traffic control plan for review. Uh, once we've reviewed that and we're comfortable with it, um, that would be the time that we could share that with our regional partners and other projects to make sure that we're coordinating closely so that you know, the one of the three veins of our of our county uh, remains open, if not all of them. So, Commissioner Schifrin. Yeah, I, I, having been around this Murray Street Bridge project for what seems like decades, um, I don't disagree with what people are saying. But when the county was doing the um, park project at the Yacht Harbor. 
there was a big concern that it would conflict with when the Murray Street Bridge uh, project was done and there needed to be neighborhood meetings and there was all sorts of worries about the uh, congestion. Uh, that our project has been done for seven, you know, for a goodly number of years now and the Murray Street Bridge project still hasn't happened. Some of these projects tend to be delayed. Uh, if they all actually start construction at the same time, um, then I think it is going to be a real challenge and it's going to um, take a lot of coordination. On the other hand, uh, I'll be more concerned about all of that, whether that's actually going to happen when they all go out to bid. And um, until that happens, I remain a little bit skeptical based on past experience, whether in fact um, this uh, gridlock is uh, a problem that we're, we're, we're going to face. Thank you. Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Jerry. I just one additional comment. I mean, you know, uh, certainly agree, hope for the best and plan for the worst. And, and to that extent, I do think um, Commissioner Quinn's suggestion that we uh, have um, a clear schedule uh, for, for how these projects will be phased will, will be really helpful um, to provide that information to the public and, and establish some confidence um, that uh, there'll still be a way through. Um, and then one additional question. Um, have you considered anything within the contract for the Murray Street Bridge, any incentives um, to the builder to complete the work faster? Um, you know, I, I'm aware that this has been done in the past with um, some of the construction of highways in Southern California, where you know there was a direct monetary incentive, um, you know, for every let's just say month that the the project was completed ahead of schedule, it would be. Um, you know, a sort of a bonus to the contractor and uh, any month after schedule or be, um, beyond schedule would be, you know, a detriment to the contractor financially. Is, do you consider any of that since it's, it would, it's so important that um, we get it done on time and, and keep people moving? Yes, I think we, we started looking back at the highway bridge program as well as that Prop 1 defense. I don't think we found anything that necessarily precluded us from looking into that. Um, I don't recall if, um, you know, staff um, put the effort in or, or, or determined whether that was going to be feasible. So I'll, I can follow up with you on that. Great, thank you. Okay, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll jump in here. Uh, I have a, a kind of a comment and a question. I want to say thank you so much for the presentation, the very clear overview. It was nice to see all of the um, projects and the work that's happening that, that we approve. Uh, as a member of the city council, I see, but it comes in, in pieces as agenda, particular agenda items. And so just to have that overview uh, was really helpful. Um, I would, um, let's see, as you were, was as you were opening your presentation and you said exciting, really exciting projects coming. Um, I agree. Um, and I, I just wanted to moving around to the, the Murray Street Bridge project, say only a seasoned and and really dedicated engineer would call that Murray Street Bridge retrofit an exciting project. Um, it, it clearly is going to um, challenge our community uh, in terms of how, how we move around. Um, and, you know, I just want to say it also has been a long time coming. And so um, I recognize uh, Commissioner Koenig's concerns. And I also want to acknowledge you've expressed those to the Santa Cruz City Council. Um, I, I, I do think that that high level of coordination and, um, you know, communication with uh, folks who live in the immediate vicinity about the scheduling and you know kind of getting as much detail as possible into the public's hands uh, will be very important. And um, so I guess I wanted to ask if what the, the communications plan is for uh, people in the immediate vicinity, recognizing that many, many people move through that uh, across that bridge and through those intersections on a daily basis, uh, the, the people who are going to be most impacted clearly will be the, the neighbors. And so just checking on what the plans are for communications there. I think we're still in the early stages about uh, the communication plan for Murray Street. We know that we want to develop a web page. Um, there will likely be notification mailers that go out to you know, so the surrounding residents that are there. But 
the online platform will be will likely be the, the place in which people can get their regular updates for construction. Um, you know, um, there'll be staff contact information as well. But um, you know, with once we have the contractor um, hired and on board, that's going to be the time when we'll have the details um, for the actual um, construction process and staging. And I would say that would be the same thing for you know all the regional projects that we have is that we really do have to wait and see um, when they're bid, when the project, who the contractor is, and what plan and how they submit it. Um, you know, again, we have that review and approve authority. We have a general idea of how these projects get uh, constructed, but uh, agencies don't dictate the means and methods, and so we review and approve them. So, Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I will now take it out to the public. I see one, uh, two hands up. I will start with uh, David Date. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I think the 800 pound gorilla in this conversation is the rail corridor. Uh, the Murray Street Bridge is incredibly dangerous. We lost a cyclist in 2018, Benjamin Doniak. Um, he was struck by a car. Uh, and now we're talking about making this bridge even more dangerous for a period of months and years. Why not open up that rail corridor as an interim way of uh, pedestrians and cyclists of bypassing that and and provide some sort of you know alleviation to to the situation that we're creating uh, i think i think that needs to be part of this conversation thank you thank you mr date uh next up we have uh ben vernalza there we go well, that's amazing. I was about to suggest the same thing, except I was going to go a little further and say that you take the rails out from that certain distance and you pave it over. And in the morning, you go one way and the afternoon, you go the other way for cars. So anyway, we'll throw that out. It's a wild idea, but who knows? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cook Construction. Hi, thanks for the time. Uh, my name is Bill Cook, and um, uh, without any uh, criticism of the staff presentation, uh, uh, I don't see any any uh, attempt at uh, uh, slowing the speed of cars uh, where bicycles are involved. Uh, we're in the process of adopting uh, Vision Zero. Uh, Twenty miles an hour is uh, according to uh, Vision zero is, is an appropriate speed where motorists and cyclists and pedestrians uh, share space. Um, that in uh, culturally, uh, our prejudice uh, as, as a society is to not is to avoid any impact on uh, the speed of motor vehicles. Uh, and uh, and that's 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 an operative assumption that I see ongoing in these conversations. And uh, it's and in my view, it's incorrect. Um, so if if we don't uh, involve uh, traffic calming measures, um, we're not going to see any appreciable uh, change in the safety for for cyclists and pedestrians in our roadways. Um, thank you. Thank you for your input. I do not see any more hands up from the public and um, nor from commissioners. So I think with that, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Wynn, and uh, move on to our next item. That is uh, item 26. This is the final draft of the 2045 uh, Regional Transportation Plan, the RTIP, and Amy Naranjo will provide us with a staff report. Amy, take it away. Let's see, I'm getting my setup here. All right. Hi, you can see my screen, yes? Yes. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Naranjo, and I am here today to provide an update on the 2045 Regional Transportation Plan. Let's see. 
There we go. Uh, so work on the 2045 RTP began in late 2019 and is nearing completion. Throughout the development of the RTP, staff has solicited input from the RTC, RTC advisory committees, partner agencies, project sponsors, and members of the public at key milestones, in including the review and approval of the policy, financial, and action elements. The latest round of outreach efforts began on December 2nd with the release of the draft 2045 RTP and ended on January 31st. Staff solicited the feedback on the draft document from the, advice, the RTC advisory committees in December and January. These included the Interagency Technical Advisory Committee, the Bicycle Committee, as well as the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee. Additionally, staff requested input from project sponsors, partner and resource agencies, stakeholders, public interest groups, and members of the public. No, excuse me, and members of the public. These groups were notified of the release of the draft plan and the public comment period via the RTC email distribution list and social media channels. Additionally, input was also sought from the public at the public hearings for the RTP and the draft RTP, which were held by AMBAR. The public hearings were advertised in several newspapers countywide. The comments received represent a diverse mix of transportation interests in our county. Some of the comments are about which projects to prioritize in the plan. Many comments are in support of electric passenger rail and public transit in general. Some people uh, support and want the rail with trail, while others prefer trail only options. Some people support prioritizing the repair and maintenance of existing infrastructure, while others, are, others want highway improvements prioritized over rail line improvements. Additionally, some people support uh, bus on shoulder efforts, but are opposed to the installation of auxiliary lanes and or any highway widening. Furthermore, some people express the need for more to be done to address climate change, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and vehicle miles traveled, while others requested a greater emphasis in the, in the document on linking the project list with the, with the RTP goal. However, overall, the, the final draft RTP really provides a balanced set of projects that represent the diverse interests in Santa Cruz County. Attachment four in the staff report includes a summary of all the comments that have been received thus far, including at the public hearings, as well as comments that were emailed. The main areas of the, of the draft that were revised um, include revisions that were in the chapter text and figures based on comments and uh, feedback received. Also changes that were, excuse me, changes made to the financial element that reflect recent state, federal, and local revenue estimates um, and 2021 actual. And then also we made changes to the project list that were based on revisions from project sponsors that include removing projects that have already been completed and updating costs to more, or excuse me, to reflect more recent information. And finally, we added some new projects to the financially constrained and unconstrained project list uh, and the list of those projects are included in uh, in your in your packet as well. And then a summary of the proposed of, excuse me a summary of the proposed revisions for the final 2045 RTP are included in your agenda packet as, as attachment two and three. So as noted in previous staff updates to the board, AMBAG is the lead agency preparing the EIR that serves the 2045 Metropolitan Transportation Plan and sustainable community strategy, as well as for the 2045 regional transportation plan for San Benito, Santa Cruz, and Monterey County. So to finalize the MTPSDS and the EIR, AMBAG needs the final draft constrained project list to develop the final EIR and to run the travel demand model on the final project. Your input today on any changes to the RTP will be incorporated into the final model when the EIR works. Uh, AMBAG released the draft EIR on November 22nd for public review and received comments during the 70 day period that ended that also ended on January 31st. So AMBEG is currently working on preparing the final EIR and is expected to certify in June. The final EIR will also include co uh, responses to all the comments that have been received. And then after the EIR has been certified by AMBEG, the RTC will then consider adoption of the EIR findings and approval of the final 2045 RTP. So with that being said, today's staff recommendation is that the RTC provide input on the final draft RTP and for in and provide any comments or input for the inclusion in the final 2045 RTP. 
That concludes my update and I'm happy to take your comments and questions. And in addition, AMBAG staff is on the call uh, to answer any specific questions related to the EIR. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Naranjo for that presentation. Uh, definitely a uh, helpful overview there. Uh, Commissioner Rotkin, I see your hand up. So uh, a lot of the comments, I, I spent about four hours reading through this, this report. It's an amazing amount of work went into it. And um, thankfully, it's clear writing that I think the public can actually understand, which is not always the case in public di uh, governmental documents. Um, but if I understand correctly, many of the comments were suggesting very broad kinds of responses, such as uh, all of this doesn't is an for example, I, I'm not saying this is true, but it makes a comment. It's inconsistent with the state's um, uh, goal of reducing uh, carbon impacts uh, at the level that the state's sort of uh, planning for that to happen and so forth. I'm assuming that the EIR looks at those kinds of, that, that's not in this draft plan, that has to happen sometime before a final plan with an EIR is adopted. Um, I don't want to presume what the IR is going to find or what's going to happen, but let's say for the sake of argument, there are major um, ways in which the draft EIR is inconsistent with state requirements or uh, AMBAG finds other kinds of, in their EIR work, that there's other major kinds of changes that need to take place. I assume that requires that we then revise this plan in some, or provide mitigations, one or, one or both. Do I understand correctly that in fact, it's not that we're ignoring all those comments people made, you know, about the what they felt was the inadequacy of the plan, but that that's gonna be addressed in this period between now and June when we look at a final uh, EIR on the project, on the uh, plan overall. Do I understand that correctly? I believe you do, and uh, Heather Adamson is uh, is available to speak more to that. Yep, so I'll call on on Ms. Adamson right now. Great, thank you. Uh, this is Heather Adamson, Planning Director for AMBAG. Um, as Amy mentioned, AMBAG is the lead uh, for the four agency joint EIR effort. Um, we did receive comments um, on, directly on the EIR. We have a consultant team we are working with, Rincon Environmental Consultants. Um, who are working to prepare responses to comments. Um, we also did receive similar comments as um, on uh, as RTC did on both the MTPSCS as well as the EIR um, in terms of different modes, support for projects, things like that. Uh, the final EIR um, will include responses to all the comments received. Um, it will for those... Um, uh, uh, sections of the EIR um, that do not adequately meet thresholds, um, we will uh, be preparing uh, mitigations um, similar to previous EIRs for such a large uh, programmatic level. There are um, statements of overriding consideration and mitigation measures uh, that are included that will need to be uh, considered uh, and approved uh, by both AMBAG and RTC as it pertains to its county level RTP. And uh, we expect to release the final EIR. We're scheduled to release it uh, uh, mid-May timeframe uh, in preparation for final action in June. So thank you. And so if I can add, I'll make my comments now, so I won't have to make them again later based on that comment. I, I think that this draft uh, final re, uh, report does an admirable job of moving forward on the question of addressing climate change issues. It's definitely an improvement over our past plans for how we were going to move people around the county and so forth. Whether it adequately does so or to what extent there need to be more significant mitigations or um, additional kinds of work done, remains to be seen. So I, I'm gonna, you know, not go through it. I, I can see all these places where I would say, well, I would change this or I would change that. I, I think that the staff has done a really good job of presenting a, us um, with a plan that moves us forward and in the right direction. Whether it's fully adequate is something I think that's better addressed when we have an EIR that sort of lets us know to what extent the, the environmental, that, that's the big issue for me, the, the environmental impacts, particularly on uh, carbon and climate change kinds of issues, um, alternatives to the automobile and so forth are adequate. I, I'll, I'll reserve those comments for our meetings when we get close to maybe in May on the EIR draft and then again in June. 
So I want to thank the staff for their work on this. I'm prepared to support this plan at this point. Uh, of course, pending comments from the public about it, but hope the public understands that this is not the final plan. This is a draft plan that requires some environmental review before we can fully understand the impacts that would be a result from, from the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rotkin. Uh, I do not see any more. Oh, there we go. I was just going to take it out to the public. Um, Commissioner Koenig, or Vi Vice Chair Koenig, apologies. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, I just wanted to thank staff for including uh, the SoCal uh, Drive study of a, a flex lane um, opportunities. Um, flex lanes are what, is, what are used on the Golden Gate Bridge, um, as well as down in San Diego on the, the Coronado Bridge to um, expand the, the number of lanes in, in the direction of peak capacity or peak demand. Um, and it's actually used uh, close to 50 times across the United States. And so I think it's important that we study opportunities like this um, on major corridors like SoCal Drive, um, where we can use, use the infrastructure we have smarter. Um, you know, we're really running out of uh, the ability to, to add a lot of, of new road capacity. So we have to think about new ways of using the infrastructure we have. Um, and I also think that there, there could be a lot of opportunity here given um, the uh, development pressures we're seeing uh, in the county as, a, as a represented by some of the RENA numbers um, being handed down by the state. You know, we're going to need to put 4,600 units on our zoning map here in the county. And um, hopefully we can make as much of that as possible transit oriented. Um, and, you know, flex lanes could, uh, could include lanes that are dedicated for transit um, to ensure smoother um, and faster uh, transit access throughout the county. Um, I just had a question then, you know, we, we also saw some questions about um, in public comments about uh, similar types of uses on the highway. Um, you know, there was one request for looking at congestion pricing. Um, you know, we have some pretty lofty goals in the RTP here as far as um, promoting more, uh, more carpooling and reducing single occupancy vehicle trips. I noticed that in the project list, um, there's at the beginning of the SCC RTC Caltrans section, there's, there's a Highway 1 corridor investment program and it has zero dollars associated with it. I'm just wondering, could we, is, could we look at that as sort of a catch-all for, you know, those types of, um, of studies or programs that might help reduce congestion um, and ultimately emissions as well? You know, if this commission decided they wanted to look at things, like congestion pricing in the future? Can we point to that project in the RTP and say, well, you know, this is more or less what that is accomplishing? It, if that sounds like a question for staff right yeah. now, possibility, okay. Um, so Ms. Naranjo, do you wanna take that one? I think uh, Luis there had a comment. Oh, let's see. I'll let, I'll let him address the question first. Okay. Um, <laughs> here we go, Deputy Director Mendez. Yeah, sure. I, mean, I think the, if I recall, the, the intent of that that project was um, yeah, to be a to be a catch all for all uh, improvement projects on on Highway One. Uh, and the reason why it has uh, zero dollars attached to it, uh, to it is because I think there are component pieces uh, that make up that entire you know highway uh, corridor improvement uh, uh, program. Uh, throughout the um, uh, throughout the RTP document, um, but uh, you know, Sarah uh, is our, our our lead on our highway projects, and uh, and you know, I've just got more detail on that than she can provide. And uh, I do see Ms. Christensen's hand up, and so I'll call on you next. Thank you, um, Commissioner Koenig. Um, you are correct. I think the way that it would happen is that would be kind of a catch-all, and then if a project actually is uh, developed and moves forward, we would then add a new project in the RTP at a later date. Okay, that, that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Or do commissioner, any other commissioners have questions or comments at this time? And I will, uh, I will ask uh, members of the public, I don't see any hands up, but if anyone in attendance would like to speak, now is your opportunity. And I see Jack Nelson, 
has a hand up. Go for it. Yes, uh, thanks for the opportunity to comment. Um, I did submit comments by email uh, on this, and uh, that was by January 31st. For some reason, they're not included in your agenda packet. Um, so I'm going to speak briefly about what I had to say. I'd also um, like to draw attention to the comments submitted by the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Uh, which are on page 20 of your packet for this item. Um, I began my comments um, uh, revealing my angst about uh, what is contained in this RTP uh, draft. And I began this way. My overview reaction to the 2045 RTP is that it is well supplied with aspirational green language about livable communities, climate, and sustainability. Unfortunately, then come the contradictions and capitulation. Lurking in Appendix E's RTP project list, we see the Greenhouse Goliath, a steady sequence of planned Highway 1 expansion projects, poised to continually to continue incrementally turning the urban portion of the highway into an eight lanes wide river of cars, trucks, and poisons. The Goliath is positioned to capture a lion's share of future expenditures while confounding any sideshow attempts to escape the unsustainable climate ruinous dominance of the automobile. So what I'm saying is this RTP is like a very good person on a mistaken suicide mission. And uh, I'm, sh I'm sure everybody struggles with that, but um, I needed to say it to you. So thank you for the chance to speak. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Mr. Vernazza, you're, you're next. For okay. Now. I was so happy to find out, Commissioner Brown, that there is a subsidization, subsidization for e-bikes. That's going to make it wonderful, especially for the South County. Um, and we're looking forward to that. That also comes into the planning for how they're going to get to, to Cabrillo easily and safely. And under the train trail plan, uh, it doesn't include any trail beyond Buena Vista and San Andreas. Uh, to get there. So I think you need to take that into consideration. And also, I just want to remind you that 2000, in 2045, all our high school students in the county today will be 40. So I'm going to be sending, and my co-chairman will be sending a letter to the commissioners about what needs to be done now to get this moving. You can fly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Equity Transit. Hi, thank you, dear commissioners and staff. I appreciate the extensive work done. There are concerning issues with the final draft 2045 RTP where funds that should be prioritized to bring rail to our community instead seem to be reallocated to highway widening, despite the requirement for matching funds for highway widening, a concern RTC staff brings up regarding funding rail. We've received Proposition 116 Clean Air and Transportation Act funds from the state of California, which enabled us to purchase the track specifically for the purpose of passenger rail. In 2012, only 10 years ago, we began the concerted step-by-step -step process of bringing passenger rail to our community. Repeatedly, community surveys show our majority support passenger rail alongside a trail. Rail and trail is the preferred scenario identified by the Unified Corridor Study, which studied and rejected the trail-only option. In February 2021, the Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis was completed after looking at 18 different transit configurations across our corridor, and the RTC identified and approved electric passenger rail as the locally preferred alternative, selected by the RTC not highway widening and bus rapid transit. 
The award-winning Coastal Rail Trail is being built now, and after more than two decades of work, numerous community meetings, investment of substantial funds towards bringing environmentally wise electric passenger rail to our community, Greenway, an organization founded in 2017, developed a misleading information campaign that has led to the deceptive June ballot measure in attempts to rip out our tracks and end passenger rail permanently for our community. We're entering a brief window of time where federal infrastructure funding is available and we need to position ourselves to apply for these grants so we can join the state rail system which will connect Santa Cruz to cities across California. Imagine taking rail to Monterey. We need to stick with the TCAA plan and as requested by the California Transportation Commission in 2019, move forward on a business plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, our next caller is Trin Craxel. Thank you, Chair Brown and members of the commission. I just have a simple question. Um, this is an update. Uh, this particular draft of the plan is an update from the previous draft. And um, between those two drafts, I noted that in the uh, project list, the rail line repairs and bridge rehab project, RTC-03A, has had $59,200,000 added to the unconstrained um, section of, of, of funding. And I would just ask if staff or others could explain what's included in that amount. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I will take note of questions and try to get some answers. Uh, at, at the end of public comment. Thank you. Uh, okay, next up we have Judy Gittleson. Hi, good afternoon or good morning. I'm Judy Gittleson from Watsonville and I just want to say here, here to the previous speakers encouraging the, the RTC to support rail transportation in the 2045 draft plan and prioritize rail transportation in the 2045 uh, draft plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next caller is Barry Scott. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Chair uh, Chair Brown. I want to uh, echo what uh, Ms. Praxel mentioned about item RTC-03A, infrastructure preservation. There's in the unconstrained column, 59,200,000. And I, I'd like to see more no, no surprise here, more committed to the, the constrained uh, uh, column for rail repairs, which we're obliged to, to complete. Um, I want to, on a related note, I, I hope I'm correct in assuming that the, uh, the, the idea of adverse abandonments against the, the Felton line and the, and, the, and, and the branch line have been uh, set aside and rejected for any further consideration. Um, it should be clear that uh, rail banking and abandonment are unlikely to be approved, and we should really be, uh, you all should really be uh, planning for the preservation consistent with the acceptance in February of last year of the uh, transit corridor alternatives analysis. I don't see how the commission can accept electric rail transit as the preferred alternative and at the same time be considering interim trails that require the abandonment and removal of parts of the track. So I hope that we'll get right right to it. And uh, finally, uh, there's a public misunderstanding around the San Andreas Road Trail, what might be called the diversion. And I wish that the RTC could clarify that regardless of, I've read the, the final EIR for segments 17A and 17B, and it's really not the rail line that presents the problem, the, the environmental challenges there. Uh, yet Greenway and rail opponents uh, pre present that it's the rail line's fault that the trail would go to San Andreas Road. And I, I wish that could be clarified. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Dates. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm here in La Salva Beach. We haven't had bus service in 
about six years. It was canceled before the passage of Measure D, and I supported Measure D, believing that this would patch our potholes, restore our metro service, and get Santa Cruz moving, um, and none of that's happened. So now we're looking to 2045. We still don't know how to restore our metro service. We still don't know how to get our pavement index above an F, and here come the callers asking for uh, prioritization of uh, electric uh, passenger rail in our community over all other needs. Uh, and that doesn't resonate with Santa Cruz voters. Um, and it should make any commissioners supporting this nonsense concerned. Um, just as Leopold, uh, <laughs> just look no further than Leopold. Uh, so we need to prioritize things that can be done now uh, that benefit people that live here currently. Uh, so I appreciate looking forward to 2045, but uh, let, let's really uh, let's really just put the impetus on what can be done within our lifetimes to get people moving, and that's that's going to do um, that's going to that's going to do well at the uh, at the ballot at the ballots. Thank you. Uh, okay, our, our next speaker is Jack Brown. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Brown and commissioners. I'm Jack Brown, resident of Apple. Um, just wanted to make a comment. I think it's kind of funny that Equity Transit is making comments about Greenway's longevity when Equity Transit was basically started last year, uh, informed by Friends of the Rail Trail, just another entity within itself. Um, but uh, my main point really here is I think we should we should move cautiously on any rail preservation, especially with the Greenway initiative being on the ballot in June. Again, 16,000 people, 170 volunteers gathered signatures to get those signatures. 13,000 were certified. Um, it was the largest in Santa Cruz County. So. Back in the time when the RTC was mostly composed of a rail-centric uh, majority where decisions were made not to look at an interim trail to proceed with looking at rail, we've seen the composition of it change. We're seeing more involvement by the community. And this will be the first direct vote by the people of Santa Cruz on what they want. And I was one of the 170 that went out to, to talk to communities and you know to get out of this echo chamber on social media and the RTC meeting people that you know have the time to be able to, to attend. And people are really encouraged Mr. Brown, to have an interim trail. Mr. Brown, I'm I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but I, I just wanted to ask if you have a comment that's specific to the RTP plan. Yeah, just I mean, for the RTP plan, is just be cautious about moving forward with uh, any moves to preserve rail in the in the sections that were noted until we have our election in June. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any additional hands up uh, from members of the public, so I will bring it back to the commission for deliberation and action. I see uh, Commissioner Rotkin has a hand up. A move approval of the draft um, uh, 2045 plan uh, as presented to us by staff and look forward to the environmental review of that. And there will be, I think, a more robust uh, debate and discussion among the commissioners about uh, this whole issue before we get to a final plan. Thank you. I second that movement to move forward. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second, and I see uh, Deputy Director Mendez has a hand up. Perhaps just, to respond just, to some of the questions. Well, actually, I just want to add add one thing that um, uh, the um, the final draft uh, was, uh, after the final draft was posted to the um, uh, to the website. There's there were some additional comments that came in from uh, from Caltrans and members of the public, and so then you know there were revisions made and then reposted. Um, you know, to to incorporate uh, uh, those comments uh, and paramedics, unfortunately, um, somehow we did not receive uh, uh, Caltrans comments, um, even though they sent them at the you know within within the time frame. Um, but I just want to clarify that that the final draft includes uh, some modifications made since first uh, posted for this meeting. And let me clarify: my my motion is on the plan that was posted uh, just yesterday or the day before. You know, Okay. a few days ago, the, the latest one it was in red on, on our website. And that's the one that I spent four hours reading through. Thank, I hope it was the right one. Thank you. <laughs> that, that includes all, all that includes those revisions. Yes. I approve. 
I approve the same one that Mike read. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So um, before we call for a vote, um, I, it looks like there is one more uh, member of the public who has a hand up. Uh, Ms. Andreata, were you trying to speak to the, the RTIP before we take a vote here? I, I'll, I'll uh, give you an opportunity. Hi, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes, thank you. A 2014 addendum to the final EIR for the Coastal Rail Trail adds an alternative alignment for segment 17, call 17B, that routes the trail away from sensitive wetlands and agricultural lands. This alternative has fewer environmental impacts and is not recommended because of the rail line. It would have to happen with or without tracks. Thank you. Thank you for your input. I, um, I, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, I don't see any additional hands up by members of the commission. I did just wanna ask if I, there was a, a question about the, uh, the unconstrained, I believe it's $59.2 million uh, associated with the rail and um, the request for a breakdown on that. I'm not sure that's something we can necessarily provide today, but I um, am hoping that we could potentially get a little bit more information, um, perhaps as a uh, follow-up memo. And if you have any comments now, Director Preston or other uh, members of the staff to just give a sense of, of what that total uh, includes, uh, that would be great. Uh, I, I can uh, say something about that, uh, uh, Chair Brown. Um, uh, I think, it, as was noted by Planner um, uh, uh, Amy Naranjo, there were updates made to the to the project list, and those updates included uh, project costs. Uh, so that so there was an update to uh, to those project costs associated with the with the um, 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 uh, bridges on the on the rail line. Uh, unfortunately, those those updates have not been made before, and so those those are included in that. So it's updated to reflect the cost. It's updated to reflect the most current information that the RTC staff has. Yes. Thank it's, you. It's broken down in the plan. I remember reading the details there. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay, um, Commissioner Jenny Johnson, you. I see your hand up. Thank you. <clears throat> um, this conversation or this, my sense of all the, of, of the public input regarding funding, I find there's a great deal of misunderstanding about how transportation funding works. And to Commissioner McPherson's uh, comments earlier in this meeting, I think there would be a great deal of benefit as a former uh, transportation funding, project funding person and grant writer for many years um, I understand it very well, but there's a lot of people who don't understand it, both, I think, some maybe perhaps some new commissioners, as well as members of the public. Um, and you can tell by the level of misunderstanding, or the spectrum of understanding is really a better characterization, because of the questions that people bring up. Um, there's money to do the EIR to measure D for rail. There is not money, this and that. So not to be redundant, but I think it would, all of us would greatly benefit um, on, in, on a workshop to talk about how transportation funding works, how it relates to this plan, both constrained and unconstrained projects, and sort of connect the dots for folks who um, really continue to ask questions and make comments regarding funding when they don't really understand um, the entire universe of it. It is really complicated, and I get it. Um, but I would love to see, and I know all this information has been brought to the commission and the public at various times by the staff, and they've done a great job. But usually we talk about it in, in the context of a particular project or a particular plan in this case, um, to your point, Chair Brown, about how to, you know, how to explain that number. Um, but I think a general 50,000 foot level explanation of how transportation funding works and how it's changed on the federal level would be really helpful. <clears throat> Excuse me, beneficial. And I would love to see that agendized for the future. Thanks for the time. Thank you. 
Um, and I would just say here that I, I agree. And, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I will uh, work with uh, Director Preston to try to find an appropriate time. I'm in a hopefully a, a lighter RTC agenda <laughs> month. Um, this month is looking to be a little bit lighter, but um, yeah, coming up soon because I do think that is very important. Uh, and um, there's a lot of interest from the public. Uh, Com Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, you know, with with the time horizon of the this being the 2045 Regional Transportation Plan, um, I, I think it is important to uh, to address the climate crisis question. We've heard it so many times from the public, um, and you know, I just want to express that uh, I I completely agree that the need to uh, address carbon emissions in our community is urgent. We know that those emissions are coming from cars. And, um, you know, as some of my previous comments said, I don't, I don't think that we've completely fleshed out a solution here in this plan, but it's, it's going to be incumbent on this commission to do so in the very near future. Um, you know, I just want to address this point. A lot of people keep uh, who, who bring up the, the urgency of addressing the climate crisis um, then go to the train as a solution. And, um, you know, I, I agree with the problem, but not that particular solution. And, um, you know, I would reference a gentleman named Steve Tatey. He was the principal construction inspector for the VTA for 23 years. I, I encountered him while I was canvassing once. Um, and he said, you know, he, he was a little, I think, ultimately disappointed in the results of, of the, uh, his career. He said, look, the problems with the train are this, how are you gonna get people out of their cars and onto a train? How, where are people gonna park their cars when they drive uh, to the train to get on it? <laughs> and, and how are you gonna prevent people from hitting your train with their cars? So, I mean, we have 100,000 cars using Highway 1 every day. If, if we're going to address the climate crisis, we need a solution that allows us to use cars better, faster, and cleaner. And, and any solution that ignores the huge number of cars on our roads, um, you know, it is not really a solution to the climate crisis. We've seen that where, where trains are built. People are not migrating from cars to trains in mass. Um, so, you know, I think that this this plan has enough in it that we can move forward. I'm supportive of the motion today, but I, I do think there's some serious work uh, for this commission ahead in figuring out um, how we reduce congestion, it, it financially incentivize people to convert to electric cars, carpool, uh, use car share and ride share services like Chariot, Liftline, or Uber Pool, and, and increase trends at ridership. Uh, no small task, um, and, and again, a, a lot of work ahead, but. Um, I just want that to be present in everyone's minds and know, uh, and for the public to know um, that I myself and I think this entire commission is deeply uh, committed to, to finding ways to address the climate crisis. Thank you, Mr. Koenig. Commissioner Rotkin. In order to be brief, I'll just say there are alternatives to taking automobiles to get to a train. Um, other communities have found ways to do that. They involve public transit and a number of other kinds of options that are quite realistic, as well as the possibility of you know, electric bikes and other kinds, not for everybody, uh, but I, I wouldn't, uh, I would not led to the conclusion that there's no way to escape the private automobile is the way to get between your house and whatever kind of public transit options we develop, including mm -hmm. both, both buses and trains and as, as uh, public transit options. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand, and then I see Commissioner Johnson after. Well, since we're giving local or personal flavor on this discussion, I uh, commuted on the SV from San Francisco to Sunnyvale, rode my bike to the station, put the bike in a bike locker, and then, then walked the last two and a half miles to get to my place of work. So um, it was worth it for me because the ride on the SV coming down the peninsula was uh, great. I got a lot of homework done, you know, because the work, you, know, you definitely have a lot of homework in the engineering field. And so I really, really appreciate it. And uh, so I think there is a time and a place when the community can afford it, when the community has the, the demand, because all these infrastructure features cost a lot. And so you have to look at whether or not that is a feasible fiscal possibility. And I think that's what people are needing to understand in Santa Cruz. The feasibility on a financial scale in an area that doesn't have many jobs relative to like the Bay Area, for instance, 
doesn't have um, infinite resources in terms of water to build new houses and a lot of other features, which makes it very difficult to complete and finance over time. That means paying the people who operate it, doing all the work to maintain over time. So I think someone phoned earlier and said that I voted for D because I thought I'd get my Metro bus back in my community. There's no Metro. One of the easiest solutions right now to our transportation problem, especially for considering Watsonville, is to increase the Metro rides. So we are not looking at solving a problem in the easiest way we can do right now. We're working on something that is, you know, I hated the idea that uh, rails were taken out of LA. I hated the ideas that rails were taken out of the, uh, the Oakland Bay Bridge. My father took them. That's the way people got around the San Francisco Bay Area. But now we're in a different era, we're now in a different era that has different cost structures. And to build something from scratch is going to be a huge burden for Santa Cruz. We need to get real. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bertrand. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, in some ways, uh, and I appreciate um, Manu's uh, comments, in some ways, organic solutions are presenting themselves, aren't they? I mean, there's a state mandate as far as electric cars uh, that in 15, 20 years, uh, you'll see a, a huge shift away from gas consuming vehicles. Uh, the pandemic has meant that just fewer and fewer people are actually, you know, using their cars. I can speak for myself and my wife. Uh, we fill up our tank, you know, once a month almost now, but where before is once a week. Um, and I don't know how productive it is with the preaching and the demonizing that we hear from different groups uh, of, of people who use cars. Uh, I do know that those very same people use their cars. I've seen it. Um, when we've had commission meetings, how many times have I asked people how they got to the commission meeting um, and everybody used their cars? Not even, true. Even though people are preaching that, in fact, we should not be using our cars. So um, I think a little less demonizing, a little bit more solution-oriented uh, kind of dialogue is uh, much more effective. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. I uh, will now uh, bring it back around to the matter at hand, the uh, approval of the RTP plan. Uh, I, I do just want to make a quick comment, and I'm going to say I have lots of feelings, uh, you know, and I'd love to talk about my, uh, you know, my personal practices and, um, you know, my, um, my my feelings about uh, our the climate crisis and and how we are um, are challenged to address it in a meaningful way, um, particularly when we look at uh, you know expanding and improving uh, car capacity. Um, I'm going to reserve those comments, as Commissioner Rockin said, until we get into environmental review and and uh, looking further into uh, the the con consequences and possibilities that 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 kind of uh, study uh, presents to us. Um, but I did want to make one comment about the RTP and just rem remind folks, as I have been reminded uh, by fellow commissioners I've spoken with recently and our director. Uh, this plan is, you know, so when we look at what's in the unconstrained budget, what's constrained, uh, this is a, in many respects, a living document as well. And uh, we will make changes depending upon funding that becomes available, um, depending on what environmental review uh, finds. Um, there, there are many variables. And so our decision today is not a final word on um, how we will move forward and um, in, in and the, the specifics of that. So I just wanted to remind folks that um, this is a this is a guidance for us <laughs> as we move forward. And I appreciate the work of our staff to present it to us and and uh, um, produce the report. So with that, I think we will we're ready to uh, take a vote. And I will ask for a roll call. Ms. Para. Bertrand. Hi, Bruce. Commissioner Brown. Aye. 
Commissioner Johnson, Randy Johnson. Which one? Commissioner Randy Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Alternate uh, Lowell Hurst. Aye. Commission Alternate Hernandez. Aye. Commission Alternate Shiffrin. Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn. Approved. Commission Alternate Jenny Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Parker. Aye. And Commissioner Rockin. Aye. That's unanimous. All right, we are now, um, we've completed our uh, agenda for open session. We will now move into closed session. We have one item on the agenda and um, I'm not sure who will give us a, an overview of how this will go. Would that be you, Mr. Mattis? Yeah, I, I can do that, but, uh, Madam Thank Chair. You. So the, the commission is going into closed session regarding labor negotiations related to the two bargaining units for RTC, the mid-management and, uh, and, and the community of RTC employees, the core group. And so um, we are uh, at the moment not anticipating any report out of closed session. Um, and uh, the we will take up the issues separately. We'll take up core first and then RAM separately. All right. Um... I will note that we got an email from Ian Barry that has the link to the closed session. Yes. Right. Thank yeah, you. So my question, so we drop out of this, Madam Chair, uh, the session and go into that? Yes. yes. Okay, we'll thank you. We'll be using that link. Um, I see a, uh, Commissioner Hurst. Uh, just tell me again where I can find that link. You got an email that was sent to you by Ian Barry, B-E-R-R-Y, that gives you thank a you. link to the closed session. Yeah. I'll resend it to you, Commissioner Hurst. Thank you. Great. So we will uh, move into closed session. And since we do not expect a report out, I will just announce now that the next RTC meeting is scheduled for Thursday, April 7th, uh, 2022 at 9 a.m. And with that- Madam, Madam Chair, I think uh, Commissioner Parker was attempting to make a comment. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see No, it. I was just going to say, uh, I was going to, uh, wait, uh, I, I want to make sure I got it too, because I- I just got appointed. So some of the things are coming in and some of them aren't. So thank you very much. If you could send me the link as well. I appreciate that. Thank you. And with that, uh, we and will- Madam, Madam Chair, if I may, sure. I, I just wanted to remind folks that there, we will be having a TPW meeting this meet. This, the main purpose of the TPW meeting will be to have the AB 361 findings necessary to continue to have hybrid and or virtual meetings. Got it. Oh. Okay, so TPW on the third Thursday and our next uh, regular meeting will be April 7th. And with that, we'll adjourn our open session and see some of you in closed session. Thank you very much.